Good morning, everybody, and welcome to a very special program today um, and about tokenization and the um, future of investment banking. Uh, this is a panel that we thought would be relevant as we see the rise of Web3 and the rise of smart contracts, tokenization, uh, fundraising through NFTs, fundraising through various uh, Web3 platforms. And we, we, we want to take a view on, on what we see the future is going to hold. Um, so let me introduce some of the folks that are on today. First and foremost, I have with me Valerie Shepard. Uh, Valerie had uh, the treasurer at PNG for um, a long time, um, but also uh, with the Fed Reserve. Um, and uh, so we wanted to get a regulatory view. And, and so I'm very grateful that she's been able to join us here in the studio. So welcome, Valerie. Um, then let me introduce some of our panel uh, that is joining remotely. So we have uh, Dr. Andreas Filman uh, with Squire Patton Bog. Um, he is a corporate attorney um, and has advised several companies um, on uh, and, and, and been in the financial space for, for most of his career, uh, including being with as in-house counsel with um, a head counsel for uh, Mitsubishi Tokyo. And, 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 and other um, banks. So Andreas, uh, welcome to the program. I look forward to your, your views and opinions on, 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 on tokenization. Um, next we have Chris Richards, uh, Richardson. Um, and, and Chris is a, a serial entrepreneur. He has founded several companies um, and has a great amount of experience in, in raising capital um, prior to um, creating IDP, which is a um, blockchain-based uh, investment banking platform. Um, not necessarily, uh, you know, uh, something that I would say tokenization, but because he's using um, uh, both sides of the equation, but certainly that's part of his platform. So Chris, I, I welcome you to the program. Um, then we have Raj Ramamurthy. Raj is um, based in San Francisco and has um, a extremely interesting platform which is both based on index as well as 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 tokens um and so he is indexing um categories and and and, and allowing access to capital and most importantly allowing um a platform where uh, token holders can actually possibly trade in the background as well amongst themselves so creating excess uh, additional liquidity along with the fractal ownership of any asset um, so welcome, Raj. Um, we have Brian, and Brian uh, has a Web3 uh, platform, which is um, Raise, and Raise is uh, what I would consider the next generation of platforms for um, small businesses, the small to medium businesses, as well as large businesses looking to raise or access capital. Um, Lars Rottweiler comes to us from Germany, and Lars is, has MBank. Uh, Lars previously was with uh, with um, uh, Deloitte and with um, uh, I'm sorry with with P uh, with with um, Lars. Uh, let me let me let me not be confusing here. So um, Lars comes from uh, Deutsche Bank. I'm sorry, and 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 has uh, also uh, significant experience other than Deutsche Bank as well. Um, so welcome everyone to the program. Let's start this off really. Uh, quickly, and we'll go ladies first. So I am going to put Valerie on the spot and say, <laughs> Valerie, what do you think of tokenization and the future of investment banking um, as it relates to raising capitals? And then when we say tokenization, we look at it from all perspectives from NFTs um, uh, to uh, uh, what, what we will be raising next in the metaverse. Mm. Um well, let me first and foremost say I'm not an expert on cryptocurrencies, um, but I am a expert on what companies need and what companies look for from investment banks. Um, as the treasurer of Procter & Gamble uh, for a number of years, as well as um, being on the board of the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland, for six years, and then prior to that, um, some involvement with them as well. Um, it's uh, an interesting space. It's vastly evolving. Um, we'll hear more about that, I'm sure. From my perspective, it's um, is frankly not ready for prime time. 
Um, in other words, it's not in, it's not ready for a company like uh, a blue chip company or the company boards that I'm on to use this as an investment vehicle uh, to store their cash safely, right? Um, however, the technology behind it is so, so vastly important and there's so much future ahead for it. Uh, when I was at Procter & Gamble, we have a whole team looking at, at blockchain and, and NFTs and spending a lot of time thinking about how it can be used within our supply chain, frankly. Yeah. And, um, uh, and so that's, that's been really, really, really important to us. Um, from a regulatory standpoint, uh, I don't speak for the Federal Reserve Bank, for sure. I'm no longer on their board. That ended uh, just a year ago. Um, but I will say that that from a from my point of view, we do need to have a bit more regulation on NF, NFTs and on um, cryptocurrencies. As you know, we've seen some collapse of that of late. Now, some of that was just plain old fraud and bad management had nothing to do with the technologies. But I do think that. Um, for a base of uh, uh, solid investment in your future and your retirement, you know, play around with cryptocurrencies, learn about it, but don't invest heavily yet unless you have the money to lose. Uh, <laughs> and many of the people on this panel do have that money and they may have the opportunity for a huge return, but for the, 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 the mom and pops, the Aunt Mary's out there, um, I'm not quite sure it's 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 ready for uh, you to put your life savings in at this point in time, maybe in the future. OK, so we have now a regulatory perspective. Um, you know, we can certainly discuss this uh, for, for quite a long time. So but we won't. Uh, we will move on from this perspective <laughs> and uh, lie, huh? <laughs> even just right there, because I think that. Uh, you know, when we talk about crypto winters and there's a there's a there's several programs coming up and there and I don't want to spoil the surprise. But, you know, when we look at even um, Bitcoin and we say, hey, look, we saw a collapse of Bitcoin. But if you realistically look at where Bitcoin was uh, three years or five years ago, and then you look at what happened during um, uh, during the pandemic and in, in the regular stock market and you look at where crypto is today, uh, you know, crypto is trading higher than it was five years ago. So, so is it really a winter? But that's a, that's a panel discussion for another panel. So I will leave it at that. Um, regulatory, yes, governments are good at regulation. That's what governments do. Governments don't create. It is the people on this panel that create. Um, so with that, let me turn it over to Lars. Uh, Lars MBank is a very interesting platform. Um, what is your view in European markets? Um, are you seeing investor resistance? Well. Uh, let me put some things clearer. MBank is a banking as a service provider globally, and we open banks uh, out of a like a cookie cutter. And lots of our new clients are obviously uh, focusing on tokenization of assets, tokenization of digital securities. And you just called out uh, cryptos, but there's a huge difference between a crypto and a token, right? Uh, crypto is just an imaginary number anywhere uh, on, on a system. While uh, when it's tokenized, it uh, means there is a valuable asset behind. There might be fungible or non-fungible tokens. Uh, one of them is unique. There's only one available, like the Picasso on the wall, which has an NFT behind. The other one might be exchangeable, like a dollar note or a euro note in your uh, wallet, right? So um, what we see uh, globally is a huge trend, not only in Europe, it's really globally right now. I'm actually based uh, out of Dubai since, since a while, since two years now, even though I'm German. Um, there is really a huge trend of uh, tokenizing any kind of assets, right? We tokenize uh, not only real estates uh, in Dubai, but we also have in the US, uh, uh, one of our clients tokenized $58 billion worth of assets in 2022. So there might be fact factory lines, there might be any uh, companies as, as, as all, it might be just a very specific solution out of the science world. So tokenization is clearly something we see coming with a huge demand. And uh, again, it's not crypto. Uh, it might have similarities, but there's a huge difference on the regulations behind, obviously, uh, and also about the assets and then the, uh, the, the, the value of this specific asset. Thank you. Um... Andreas, that's a that's an interesting uh, point, uh, and I think that that taking that a little bit forward now from a legal perspective, uh, when we look at 
tokenization, when we look at, let's segregate crypto out of the conversation, and let's look at just purely tokenization of any asset class. Legally, is it sound? Is it a sound practice? Is it something because right now, um, you know, we we see companies, young companies that are raising capital um, <clears throat> for shares um, and or for asset backed um, uh, scenarios, in, in including debt. Um, is this legal? Yeah, and, and that's a very good point. Um, as we just uh, heard from Lars, we have uh, security tokens which if they fulfill all the requirements under the directive for market instruments, they regard it securities token. And this is already regulated. This makes things a little bit problematic because if you issue such kind of security tokens, you are directly into, go directly into the regulation. And this point has of course been covered and, and, and seen by the European Commission. And they want to uh, change the regulation because right now, there's a lot of fragmentation in the European member states. In addition, we have um, we see that this regulatory framework might hinder the uh, digital in innovation. So what they want to do is they want, of course, stay with the securities tokens, which need to be regulated if they fall into the in financial instruments um, category, but. On the other hand, they want to address this new world and say utility tokens, which not regarded security tokens should be not covered and should be maybe regulated differently. And therefore they have um, drafted, I would say three uh, regulation. One is the Mika reg uh, directive, then we have the DORA, and then finally there's a proposal to regulate the market infrastructure. But I don't want to talk too much about regulations So maybe the other guys on the panel can continue about this. Andreas, just a quick follow-up. You have a lot of experience with venture capital and, and with um, uh, you know, and family offices and, 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 and large investment vehicles. Um, are you seeing a trend towards tokenization from um, wealth? Yes, we see this, but the problem is some parties, they definitely want to step in, but they're a little bit afraid to run into regulations. So we have not only regulations on the issuer side, we have also regulations on the buyer side. So, and, and this might hinder the, um, the, the, the market you are just talking about, but, but I'm quite sure that as soon as we new uh, regulation should come in place and this will take one or two years the market infrastructure will take a uh, change to them interesting um christopher um your your experience in establishing um a blockchain based uh bank is is is, is something unique uh in the uk um so tell us a little bit about what your challenges are and what you see as the future um, as 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 regulation catches up with um, tokenization, yeah, I think uh, both Lars and Andreas hit on some some really great points, uh, and I think when we think about tokenization and the digitization of assets in any way, you have to look at okay, why are we doing this? What's the benefit? What's who's getting what out of this? And from an investment banking perspective, it our perspective is that it's really the same thing as digitizing any industry does, which is it lower costs and lowers costs and accelerates things, which means capital markets can now become available at smaller ticket sizes where they weren't previously. And so investment banking services can now be made available to small and medium enterprises, which are really the soul of the economy around the world. So it sort of opens up this, I don't know how big, four or five trillion dollars worth of capital markets that were previously uh, really just very small private transactions. Conversely, or obversely, from the investor side, it gives you transparency and clarity into deals where previously to engage in any sort of private transaction, you were going to have to go through months of due diligence. You were going to have to set up your own SPVs. You were going to have to construct the deal entirely on your own. 
And now this can be done in a fairly you know, automated, standardized, transparent, regulated way using existing securities law, existing uh, mechanics around notes, debentures, equities, et cetera. The question is from there, where do we go? And where does tokenization play into this? Because really you don't need to be on a public blockchain to do any of that today. In fact, that's, that's what we're doing today. And we don't use public blockchain. Uh, as Anand said, we are blockchain under the covers. But that's really just for maintaining the registry purposes. There's nothing critical in, in the blockchain itself to our technology and what we're doing. But when we talk about tokenization and the future of investment banking, I think it's really plugging into the, the ethos and the ideas that led to the crypto community to begin with, which are not so much anti-central bank as they are anti-boundary. And you know, once you have a digital asset that's understood and regulated and, and follows all the anti-money laundering laws and all the prospectus rules and all the things that one needs to do in whatever your jurisdiction is, you can take that and tokenize it and plug it into all these regulated exchanges that are popping up around the world. And so you could take that same token and put it in ArchX in the UK and put it in Securitize in the US and put it in Investax in Singapore and it's the same underlying asset, the same regulated asset, the same clarity, transparency uh, that any investor wants to see. But now they can trade it globally and they can trade it in their local currency and they can really uh, sort of provide liquidity in a market that traditionally was extraordinarily illiquid. And I think that expansion and opening of the this, this sort of middle market is really uh, the power of tokenization and, and where we're headed. That's that's incredible. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I think that uh, you've hit absolutely the correct side of of where we see uh, tokenization hopefully going towards, and and a very positive view of it. Um, Raj, uh, coming to you, you started off um, several years ago looking at um, creating fractal ownership in assets uh, such as art and wine and. Uh, um, and, and you've evolved from that point of view, um, you know, from from having looked at your company quite uh, closely, uh, you've 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 taken the compliance path, if I would, instead yeah. of the development path. Uh, so talk to us a little bit about your evolution uh, into indexes and, 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 and how you see indexes playing a critical role in tokenization. Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> Um, we did start out with individual assets, like you mentioned, um, real estate, wine, art, and we did follow the compliance path from the very beginning. We were not um, wanting to go on the wrong side of the legal regulations. So from that perspective, we did build in a lot of infrastructure to support private placements of security tokens in the US, which still is not as popular as it is, um, say, in Europe or Asia. What we did find is our investors on the buy side were a little hesitant to invest into single assets. They found the risk to be a little too high. And they also found that tokenization wasn't adding a whole lot um, in that process in terms of value. So what we decided to do instead is to create these indices, which group different assets together and we risk crunch them and provide the investor with the basket, if you will, of different assets. And we provide them with a risk score and we provide them with some kind of um, investment appreciation value. So now they have access to a diverse number of investments or assets with one investment. And they also have a lot of risk mitigation in the process. So think of it like we're creating, as you know, Anand, the Beverly Hills Index with the city of Beverly Hills where we have 500 different entities in this one index. So an investment into this one index would provide the investor with access to those 500 entities in different proportions, all completely regulated, fully compliant with SEC regs. So in this fashion, on the sell side, they get access to capital markets, which they never did before. As standalone entities are too small to get that kind of access, but as a group, they're now big enough to attract that kind of capital. And on the buy side, we have that interest into investing in these types of entities with a single investment, which they couldn't have done before. So that evolution is opening up a broader range of access for both the sell side and the buy side. 
That's a very interesting um, look at tokenization and, and, and looking at it from creating what I would say to you an institutional class uh, product um, that would be certainly much more interesting to institutions than uh, to private investors. So, you know, so it's a it's a very unique way of going. Um, I wanted to see if um, if uh, Princess Alessandra had joined us. Um, do we have um, Princess Alessandra on? Uh, no, I guess she's not on yet. Um, so what I would say is, uh, coming to, to Brian, Brian, um, you are what I would like to call the, the typical face of Web3. Um, you are young, energetic, uh, you have a amazing looking platform, uh, you've, you've onboarded a bunch of transactions in, in the SMB market. Um, Tell us a little bit about your journey and, and, and what you see as the future for Web3 from a, a different perspective. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate the opportunity to speak here. Um, I, you know, I, <clears throat> I do somewhat represent Web3, but I also represent uh, your traditional entrepreneurship and, and small business startup mentality. Um, you know, over the last couple of decades, I've been a part of uh, companies, uh, you know, going kind of straight to a large valuation and being sold for, you know, a billion plus to working in with small business owners, uh, with marketing companies and your traditional kind of SMB focus. And what's fascinating is that um, most people in the marketplace right now with Web3 are focused on the macro and 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 rightfully so because it's it's a huge impact right now on everything that we do just like the internet i remember being in college in 98 and um thinking that i had kind of missed the dot com uh, uh movement uh because by the time 2000 came around everything had just absolutely collapsed or so i thought uh and really what was happening is it was the beginning of the real actual innovation of technology applying to real business use cases and all the hype and all the fraud and fud was getting washed out and it's so i think we've all said this uh but it's so interesting watching history repeat itself again uh and i look at it through the eyes of what is everyday people what what are everyday people going to do with this technology um, I set crypto aside for a minute. I set all that stuff aside. And, you know, the way that I approached it as a, a founder and a startup, you know, kind of business owner is how can I take this technology and make things better, faster and cheaper, similar to what Chris was talking about. Uh, and, and that's how I've, as a technologist and somebody that's been in software for a long time, I've always believed that's really the role of technology is to improve what we already have, to make things better and faster, to invent new ways uh, to be able to help people and help businesses. And that's where I see blockchain and tokenization making a huge impact. Specifically with small business, it is still incredibly complex to raise small amounts of money and large amounts of money for business owners. We have very limited options. When you set aside bank loans and, and, and government loans and things like that, and you begin to look around and say, how can I raise capital in a compliant way as regulation continues to ramp up. And then people think they can just jump over to digital assets and crypto, and they did. It's called ICOs, and we saw how that ended up. And one thing I'll, I'll kind of say here as I wrap up with this response is that I looked at what everybody did wrong in the ICO markets, which was small startups acting like they were going public using crypto as a crutch because it was easier and faster versus acting like a real startup and raising private capital and raising private money. And so we're actually in the middle of that right now of serving small businesses and helping them raise money in a compliant way with a compliant platform following regulation, but using technology and blockchain to make that way faster, better, and save them money. And that's really what my passion and focus is. Yes, that's a very interesting perspective because you're absolutely correct. Um, small business as usual gets left behind. Um, and uh, when innovation happens, innovation tends to happen for larger things um, because typical um, investors are looking for larger returns. Um, so when it comes to small raises and small and and and, and transactions that are uh, you know below that three million dollar threshold, 
uh, it, it certainly is is a challenge to to go out and raise capital for anybody who has ever tried. And I think there's a lot of founders in this room, regardless of whether they're billionaires or not, um, that would 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 say the same thing. Um, and 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 has it been difficult and challenging for you to to acquire uh, new capital sources onto your platform? Yes and no. So we made it a lot easier for companies to quickly onboard in a compliant way without any prior experience, as long as they had the right regu you know, regulatory kind of checks like lawyers and things like that in place. Um, and so we, we, we set out to remove friction from the process. Uh, not all that different than when, you know, uh, crowdfunding started to become a thing and people started saying, how can I raise money in a crowdfunding like environment? I looked at it in a similar approach and say, how can we stay in the private placement market, but make it crowdfunding like easier for people to be able to get their message out to the to to people that have the money, VCs, family offices, accredited investors? How can we make it simpler, faster and better? And so we're finding a tremendous amount of interest for, from builders and startups, as well as investors that have figured out that they can come into a platform like ours. And I'm sure there's others out there that are starting to build like this, where an investor can complete a transaction a private placement um, uh, environment in a matter of 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes versus it taking days, weeks, or even months. And it's the way we go about it and the process, not just the technology. Um, so we're actually finding it uh, to be uh, a lot easier these days because of, of technology. Yeah. So Christopher, coming back to you and your focus on global markets um, and 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 be the the theoretical ability of being able to cross list on on various exchanges um, to raise capital from ju various jurisdictions. Um, that seems quite complicated. Um, does does this make it does this new environment make it easier to access those? Because, for instance, uh, doing a dual listing, uh, you know, even in 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 unified Europe prior to Brexit, uh, listing cross listing on two exchanges was quite complicated, even if it was Frankfurt and London. So, how does how does this technology make it easier? Yeah, I think that's uh, you, you've hit the nail on the head. And you know, if you think about the traditional process. You know, Frankfurt, London, you know, uplisting from uh, from AIM in, Aust in London to the NYSE or the NASDAQ, whether you're actually doing uplisting or doing ADRs, this is an incredibly expensive, heavyweight process. Um, and, and with everything digital, you know, the digital exchanges are removing that cost and friction, or not removing it, but dramatically reducing it. And you do still, of course, have to be regulatory compliant, right? The idea here is not to circumvent the regulation. The idea is to make formally inaccessible, illiquid assets, uh, whether that's debt or equity, available to the family offices, the accredited investors out there, and someday ultimately retail, right? That is the end game. Right? We want to make all of this available to everybody, sort of the, the democratization of capital. But in the very near term, as these uh, exchanges start to get traction, you know, they're already coming to life. They're already regulated. Uh, you were starting to see liquidity appear. Uh, I think it's going to be uh, tremendously easier than it ever has been in the past. Now, this is not replacing what exists in the market today. Right. A traditional large company that's going to go through a public offering in their native jurisdiction and is going to then uplist to a larger exchange, that's not going away. But if you're doing a 5, 10, 15, 20 million dollar transaction, you can't do that on the NASDAQ. You can't pick up the phone and call Goldman. Like that's not that's not a possibility today. And there's no reason it shouldn't be, right? The the SMEs are 50 to 90% of the economy in most countries, and they're growing and they need growth capital and they need to be able to expand their business when they're already being successful. And this is providing a platform for them to be able to do that, both what we're doing and what the other panelists are doing and what the regulators are doing and where we'll be with tokenization six, nine, 18, 24 months down the road. Wonderful. Um, I, I think with the with with the limited time that we have i think we've covered a, a great many areas of discussion um that need to be explored much more um and 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 i think that we will continue to have these conversations um but i hope that this has been helpful to everyone that has participated and and those that have viewed uh valerie i'll turn this over to you and say did this change your mind 
Well, I will say that I've learned quite a lot from the panelists. Um, and I don't know that uh, my mind has been changed because my mind was set on what is the business use case, right? And what I heard today is that, um, that all of you are focused on the business use case and how to make the uh, uh, acquisition of capital for small, medium uh, businesses much more easier, uh, cheaper, um, how to uh, create indexes so that uh, the risk of investing in one or another is reduced. All of that gives me uh, continues to give me, because I've been excited about the technology, continues to give me uh, a lot of uh, ex uh, um, hope and uh, expectation um, from this technology that it will become much more mainstream and is going to help us solve our business problems, which is what we're all about. Wonderful. So once again, thank you, everybody, for participating. Uh, we look forward to continuing this discussion in, in further panels, uh, and uh, we will look at the next panel now. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.